Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Super excited to be here. I hope you're all here, all of you in person, all of you virtually. Um, my name is Trevor Matthews from Refrigeration Mentor, and today we're going to be talking about the CO2 fundamentals. I'm going to talk about some of the things about refrigeration in general. Uh, this, uh, this event is, means a lot to me. Uh, Brian and the team, amazing. I want to thank all of them for what they do. This is my fifth year here. And I want to share a little bit of my knowledge with you. That's what I do. A uh, little bit about my background. That I was uh, in the refrigeration industry for 20 years now. It's crazy. It doesn't feel like that. I started out as a technician many, many years from supermarket installs, uh, service, maintenance, travel the world, then industrial HVAC. The biggest thing that I've learned over the years is really being consistent and persistent. The biggest thing. I got a session later on refrigeration mindset. I recommend you guys tuning into that because we'll talk about some of the things that you can do to really better yourself in your career. If you want to transition from HVAC to refrigeration or vice versa, I can teach you how to do that. But it all comes back to a mindset. And that's what I've been doing with Refrigeration Mentors, really helping professionals, refrigeration professionals, because that's, that's what we are. Technicians, we're professional. Engineers, we're professionals. And I want to talk about some of the technologies that I'm seeing in the refrigeration side and how you can learn very easily, even if you do residential refrigeration. That's refrigeration. All of it's refrigeration. People say, oh, well, I do AC, I do heat pumps. It's all refrigeration. And if you understand that fundamental cycle of refrigeration, which we're going to go through, and I do it at every one of my trainings, even my most advanced trainings, I'll go through the fundamentals all the time to walk everyone through. Uh, I'll have some QR codes up, so if you want to look at some of the refrigeration mentor programs, because my goal is to really get those refrigeration professors to their next level. I want you to be better tomorrow than you are today. And that's kind of what refrigeration mentor is built on in the foundation. Social media platforms, so if you take any photos today, if you share this, if you're virtually on and you do some screenshot, tag at refrigeration mentor, and we'll comment on it, and I'll like it and stuff like that. So make sure you do that. Uh, social media is a big thing today, and you do need to be investing time. Even if you don't post, you got to go into different Facebook groups, into diff on Instagram, and start following. The HVAC school does an amazing job. They got lots of great content. Ty, Ty Branneman, uh, AC Service Tech, all these different uh, professionals, refrigeration professionals, are sharing content with all of us to really better ourselves and and better you at that. So I highly recommend hitting up some of this. I started a podcast about two years ago. I didn't know I was a podcaster. I did a, almost 30 with Brian. Uh, I did a lot with him, and I'm like, okay, a lot of people are asking me, let's, you know, I want to learn more from you. How do I do it? So I started a podcast, and I'm all, almost at 200 episodes. I think I'm at 190 episodes. Didn't think I'd be that high in almost, I don't even think it's two years now, a year and a half. But once again, this is where you can continue to learn and grow. Having the experts on there, getting to the HVAC school podcast, listening to that while you're driving. This is one of the things that I'm kind of teaching people as well is like, how do you get an education when, man, I'm driving four or five hours a day? Well, let's start listening to educational stuff. This is what experts do. All the successful people that I follow, that's what they're, they're doing. They're continuing to grow their knowledge. And that's how you save a lot of time. Instead of you get home and all of a sudden I, I need to do studying for two hours. Well, you could have been studying two hours in the truck. So definitely get into that stuff and really start developing yourself. Are you excited? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Okay, let's get into the fundamentals. And I'm sure if you've been following me for a while, you may have seen this already. If not, there's two things on here. We have, what's this diagram right here? What's that called? What do you guys call it? Molier, pressure enthalpy. There's lots of different names to it. Log diagram, people call it. But this here is how you see different refrigerants and their heat and their heat index and how they work and you got pressures or temperatures or enthalpy and I'm not going to dive into all that but I want you to understand every refrigerant has one of those okay what you need to understand you're not going to use this in the field every day but this is how you learn the fundamentals especially when you transition from what you're working on today 410 if you're still working on old school R22 all these refrigerants are being delisted or phased down or phased out. So you really want to understand that transition into the new A2Ls or A3s or naturals like CO2. But the first step of understanding how a system works 
is going to a basic system. So right now, if you work on residential AC, commercial HVAC, commercial uh, refrigeration, every system works like this. If you look at the bigger picture and you think about it and in your mind, this is how I troubleshoot now, I'm, I troubleshoot in my mind, I can see what's going on in the pipes. It took me 20 years to get to that point, but I'm there now. But I want to help you visualize that stuff. So when you start to visualize what's happening in refrigeration, it makes the transition to all these new technologies a lot easier. Because a lot of us don't have all the confidence that we want. We look for a lot of val validation. I see this time and time again with experienced technician. And I was there even after five, six, seven years. A lot of it was I needed to call someone, ask them the question, because I wasn't super confident in, in what I, I knew, even though 98% of the time, you go with your gut instinct and you're going to be right. You make that call and then, then all of a sudden, go. so go with your gut instinct. So how does this work? Here's my mechanical system. There's my enthalpy dynamic. So when I'm thinking about a system, when it starts, I always do the process of, okay, I got power coming from the grid or I got solar power. There's solar power refrigeration systems. So I got power coming from somewhere into the system. So it goes to a breaker. It goes to fuses, goes to a contactor. That contactor doesn't start until there's some sort of control system that pulls it in and energizes it. And so that power goes through that contactor, and then it goes to a compressor. That compressor has a stator and a rotor in it. And when that energy hits that compressor, it starts to rotate. There's a magnetic field and there's a whole process behind it. But just think, it's taking low temperature refrigerant vapor and compressing it to high temperature vapor. That's what we're doing. Low temperature vapor into high temperature vapor. So it brings us up, and this is our heat, our heat index right here. These red lines is all the, diff the different type of heat. So you got motor heat, you got uh, compression heat. So everything past that compressor discharge service valve that actually right from the valve, from the valve in the scroll or the semi-hermetic, the screw compressor, right when that last squish of gas happens or compression of gas, that's the hottest point in the system. Everything from there is desuperheating. All that going up to your condenser, desuperheating. Then we get the condenser, we start to condense. So you, you'll see it go through here, and then we hit this one point. This point here is called what? Does anybody know what that's called when we hit that point on a molar or pH diagram? Where one is, the, the black line that comes down the curve? Saturation, Saturation point, and there's a specific the specific name that I call it. Dew point. Anybody here ever hear of dew point? Saturation, you're right. So this is right where you know that vapor starts to have like little droplets coming out of it of liquid. And this is where the condensation starts or the condensing starts to happen. So this is your dew point. This is a very important term in refrigeration. Okay? Your dew point is what you use to check what? And it's really on the bottom side of the thing, but this is very important. You always use the dew point to check what in a refrigeration system coming out of the evaporator. The superheat, right? Because when we have a glide refrigerant, like all the new refrigerants are glide, there's blends of refrigerant. It could have three or four or five different refrigerants. Uh, you get to that dew point, and then you know it's vapor. So this is your dew point. As you start to travel through the system, you can see here, we start to condense. The condensation starts to begin. We hit this condenser. It has air flow through it. It has heat going through it. So as that air goes through it, it's actually cooler air going through it to drop that temperature to start to condense it. So when we get to the outlet, liquid line, drop leg, people will call it, depending on your condensation line. There's lots of different terms. You need to learn all these different terms when you're talking to different refrigeration professionals. Because I've seen, and I've been in many conversations where we're talking about two different things, kind of like TD and delta T and stuff like that. You want to make sure that you understand those and that you're talking with the, the same thing about the person, uh, with that person, that professional. So as we start to leave th that other point, I forgot that what's number three, that black line going down on your, your diagram. What's that called? What was that, Jeff? Bubble. The bubble point. So now this is our bubble point. Now we're, we're full liquid. And we always need full liquid going to our metering devices, which is the next. This is where you get subcooling. I won't dive too deep into that today. There will be lots of presentation on that. 
So now you have a pressure drop, right? So we're taking this high temperature, high pressure liquid, and we're dropping that pressure. Make sense? You guys all know this stuff, which is great. And so now we drop that pressure off. It starts to flash through this meter and device, and now we, we get some uh, flashing happen. And then we get into the, the next part, which is our evaporator. It could be a case. It could be an A-coil. It could be uh, what, just uh, even a plate heat exchanger. There are lots of different things it could be, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You just want to understand that as it starts to go through there and the fans are running across it, you got refrigerant boiling and bubbling and boiling. And as it's doing that, it's pulling heat out of the people. It's pulling p heat out of the product. Okay? And then we leave from 5 to A. Going back to the compressor, this is your superheat. So you have evaporator superheat and you have compressor superheat. You always want to make sure that you, once again, do dew point when you're using blended refrigerants. And there's going to be people who tell you, no, you've got to use midpoint, but we're not going to dive into that situation. On this diagram, this refrigerant, what is it? I'm using CO2 as a refrigerant. Is, this is subcritical. And does everybody know what I mean by it's subcritical or anybody? Can they explain that? Somebody in here must know. Pardon? It still follows the PT chart, pressure, uh, pressure temperature. So you go into your PT chart, whatever refrigerant it, and you can look at this temperature equals this pressure. Make sense? On every refrigerant, it has something called a critical point, which we're going to talk about. And I, I forgot to put like a, just a standard refrigerant up there, not a natural one. So that's 744. So what, what, why is that important? Why do we just walk through that? We're in subcritical. Because um, it's important for terminology for CO2. And how do you transition your knowledge on 410A, R22, 404, whatever it is, now over to a natural refrigerant? Because I continue to hear from people uh, that, oh, CO2, it's high pressure, it's dangerous, it leaks more. All this stuff I'm hearing from people around the world. And when I, when I get back to it and I really start to learn, I've been learning CO2 for um, almost 10 years now, training it for an almost nine is that it's just another refrigerant. And people talk about there are safety precautions, but there's no different than the safety precaution for 410. All what we're talking about now for CO2 was no different 25, 30, 35 years ago when 410 came out. Oh my god, it's 400, 400 PSI. How many of you, let's see a show of hands, work on 410 systems or have worked on 410 systems? Everybody. How many of you were worried about it when you start working on 410 systems. Let's see. One, one hand, because that was you guys, you were an original. You, you, that's the first thing that came out, right? You, Chris, is Chris right? Yeah. So, so the thing is, is that you want to understand is that it is a refrigerant. Is there safety? 100%. When 410 came out, there was, 100, there was a lot of safety too. And there was that transition period, which took many, many years to get to the point where, okay, we, we, we put somebody in a truck, they go out and drive, and they just put gauges on the system. No big deal. It's going to be the same thing with these new refrigerants, A2Ls, A, uh, A3s, and CO2. But there's always a safety factor in there. We, threw a, we throw a lot of people that are inexperienced into the field at this stuff. You know, that's what we do. Contractors do it. Um, businesses do it. And say, okay, well, you go try it. And, you know, and they, they're, they're figuring it out as they go. But the biggest thing that I continue to see is that when somebody is properly trained, it doesn't matter the refrigerant. Go, I, I know, I'm friends with thousands of people that work on ammonia. But you talk to someone about, uh, from residential, for an example, ammonia, oh my, that's dangerous, it's toxic, you can't work on that. You know, and I hear this constantly. It's just, if you don't know, and you haven't been trained, and you hear things about it, then it's like, okay, it must be true. It's not true, because I need lot, lots of friends that would only work on ammonia, will not want to work on, because I hear from the same side, I wouldn't work on that to that those toxic gases or this, the, those synthetic refrigerants. But the thing is, it's all about the training. And this is what we're going to talk about today. So terminology. There's one key term that we, you need to know and that really we started to talk about more with CO2. And that's the critical point. Does anybody know what the critical point is? Or where it is on this diagram, we'll say? So right there, that's the critical point. Do you know what? Do you know what? Every refrigerant has a critical point. 
But since CO2 came out, now this is now we're talking about the critical point. And what, what do you think the critical point means? So below this critical point, we're in subcritical. And that's how every system out there, it doesn't matter what system. You talk about a chiller, AEC, VRF, whatever, VRV. We're in subcritical. We're below the critical point. When we're above this critical point, there's no pressure temperature relationship. 410 has a critical point. Above that point, there's no pressure temperature relationship. So it, you just can't jump on a PT chart and say, okay, at this temperature correlates to this pressure. That's all. The other cool thing about when you're above a critical point with any refrigerant, that now it doesn't condense. So it's not a liquid and it's not a vapor. We call it a fluid. A super critical fluid. And, and these are different terms that we just need to learn. Okay, we just need to learn these different terms. Because when we're above the critical point, does anybody know what the temperature is for CO2? Because on 410, 404 is like 160 Fahrenheit. It's a really high number. Does it get 160 degrees outside? No. I think the hottest place on the planet might be like 150 it might have got to. I don't know. If, I don't know actually the number there. I did know, but I forget. But we don't, our ambient doesn't get that hot. But for CO2, we have a, a low uh, critical point. And does anybody know what that temperature would be? Nailed it, Chris. Love it. 87.8. .8. So when we get above that temperature outside, that means we are above the critical point, And now we're in something called transcritical or a supercritical state. So there's just no pressure temperature relationship. That's, that's really what you want to understand. And this is kind of what it looks like versus versus the other one. So if I draw this like this, we go up like this, we're above the critical point, we come down. And this is the transcritical state. If you can visualize that last image that I showed you when we're in subcritical, we were below. That top line was below, but now we're above. So now that we're above, the same thing, similar thing happens. We got a compressor here. Visualize a compressor here. We have a condenser here. We have a metering device right here. And then we have flow back to the flow back to the medium temp compressor. So what does this all mean? So the biggest thing that you need to understand is that this condenser right here does not condense. So they call it a gas cooler. So now all we're doing is cooling the refrigerant. Okay, just like your condenser outside beside your house, it's condensing in there. Now we got a liquid on it. In this, in this case, when we're above here, we just actually, we have get a vapor coming up here. As we get into here, it turns into a fluid. And then as it comes down to your metering device, which is called a high pressure valve, this metering device drops the temperature and drops the pressure. We know refrigeration, you increase pressure, you increase temperature, you decrease temperature, you decrease pressure. Every refrigerant works the same. Is all that, have everybody following me so far? Okay. So we get to this metering device, and what it does, it takes a pressure of potentially 1,100 PSI, 1,200 PSI, 1,300 PSI, 1,400 PSI, 1,500 PSI, and reduces it down to 500 PSI, 550. So some people might have using different units. Okay, 100 bar down to like 34 bar. So for the people online. So what this metering device does is get it down and it drops into our receiver, which is called a flash tank, which is the next term on there. Flash tank receiver, as you can see there. So we take this, this fluid that comes down your drop leg. Some people call it, in, in, refriger in air conditioning terms, you call that your liquid line in refrigeration terms. It's your drop leg. Or, some people call it, once again, cond uh, condensation leg, or there's lots of different terms. You've got to understand those terms. And then we go through this high pressure valve that's right here, we'll say, drops the pressure down into this vessel. This vessel, some people call it vessel, tank, flash tank, receiver, it's a receiver. Okay? Now this is where your liquid is. This liquid now gets to feed, and what's cool about CO2, it gets to feed both your medium temp uh, systems as well as your low temp systems. 
an even cooler part about CO2 is you can do air conditioning and heating all in one system because there's a huge, a really high heat index for CO2. So the way this works is that now I have my liquid line, my liquid here coming from here. So on the top, there's gas. This is called flash gas. So we have some gas. So the vapor comes off the top to um, a valve right here, which is called a flash gas bypass valve. Once again, it's just a valve. So how many of you worked with electronic valves before? Show of hands. We got almost everybody in here. So it's just an electronic valve. We don't want to make it harder than, than it is. CO2 is not as difficult as people make it out to be because they don't break it down. All these meter, these electronic valves, one here and one here, what they're doing, they're just opening and closing to maintain a certain set point that we as a technician set up. We're trying to maintain a certain temperature in this receiver that liquids a certain temperature to go out all to my metering devices. Just like if you're doing air conditioning, what do you guys what do you guys want to see as your SST for air conditioning? What do you guys what do you guys have your SST? What do you guys say? 45. What else? 40. Okay, great. That's your high temp temperature. When you talk about temperature, so this is a high temp system. When I'm in refrigeration, when I say 40, 45, that's a high temp walk-in box. What are you doing, like? maybe t uh, tomatoes or something, I don't know. When we get into the refrigeration side, instead of running it at 40 or 45, we're running it down maybe around 32 Fahrenheit or zero, or maybe four degrees, or 34, 35, 36 Fahrenheit. So we have liquid going out as we leave, we go to this point. Remember we talked about this bubble point? This bubble point is where we have full liquid. When we leave a receiver, which has, let me just change the color up a little bit. When we have, so our liquid leaves here. So we'll say we have this much liquid inside here. We got liquid and that goes down through. So that's how it probably should be drawn, that red line, that first red line probably shouldn't be there for the trans. So this is my, now my evaporator. So think about, if you work on residential or commercial air conditioning, is that a coil? Or it's a coil inside the air handling unit. It's doing the same thing. It's actually just pulling the heat out of the product if we're, you're doing refrigeration. If you're doing air conditioning with CO2, it's exactly the same. The pressures are higher. Okay, you're gonna see a massive influx over the next five to 10 years on CO2 heat pumps, heavily. So all of you doing residential, you're gonna be installing CO2 in the next five to 10 years. I'm already seeing it. But is it something to be scared of? No. It's something now you're starting to learn right now here today is to continue to grow that knowledge over the next three to four to five years. So you're prepared, okay, to get a better understanding on how it works. So we got our liquid, we go through our evaporator, and our evaporator, same thing, here's my suction line. My suction line comes back, and then my medium temp compressor compresses it. And then lastly, like I said, we have low temp. So if we have low temp, then we have another line here, go down, and this is not to scale, please, especially the people online. Then we have a compressor right here, not even close to scale. But now we have a compressor right there. So now this same liquid line going out to these metering device, but the pressure is lower. We got lower pressure, we got lower what? We got lower temperature, so now I'm running systems at minus 20. Okay, and then we come back to a different compressor, our low temp compressor, because you can't take a high temperature compressor and put in a low temp application. They're designed differently. So these ones here have a different compression ratio. They run colder refrigerant through them. And then you have your suction, you have your discharge, and then it comes back to uh, the main manifold that goes back through the medium temp compressor. And this is why they're called transcritical booster systems. So you're taking this low temp discharge, comes up to, um, to medium temp suction. We have this flash gas going to this medium temp suction and it all comes back here. So these medium temp compressors are really just taking all the refrigerant and compressing it. Taking the heat out of the system, bringing it up to the condenser gas cooler where that is rejected, 
to the planet. Hopefully they're doing some sort of heat recovery. And that, that's, that's some of the main terms for sure. We're going to talk about a few more. There's one called the triple point. Write this down. The triple point's important. At 61 PSI, I think it's 4.1 bar, uh, this is the triple point. When you're below that and you have liquid CO2, it turns into something called dry ice. Anybody ever put dry ice, use it at Halloween, they put it in some water and it boils over? Well, that's what will happen. So what you need to do in a CO2 system, you've got to bring the pressure up above that 61 PSI with vapor, and then you can use liquid CO2 in that system. Trapping CO2 is, is bad compared to, say, 404 or 410. If you trap CO2 in a very warm location, the pressure will increase very high. If the system's designed properly, it's, you're okay, depending on the system, you're okay to isolate the system. But if you have a system designed at the very low pressure design, you cannot trap it because the pressure rises really high and then it can cause a leak or potential burst pipe. It would be like taking um, a pipe full of liquid refrigerant and then taking a torch. Who would do that? I hope you would never do that. It's very dangerous. You never put fire to any type of system that's sealed, especially if it's running, with refrigerant in it. So it's just that pressure will rise really, really quickly. So you just, that's training. That's what you got to be aware of. And the, one of the last things that you really need to understand is that you're going to see, it's starting to change, but over the last 10 years I've seen it evolve. You got to understand units. Celsius to Fahrenheit, bar to PSI, and vice versa. Is it hard? No. It just takes time to learn this stuff. Questions? Any questions? Yeah, Chris. I love that, that question. So now, now we're not above the critical point. It's 65. It's like today out there. I don't know what it is, 60 -oh? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So the question was, what happens when you're not above the critical point? That's what, you know, we're not, we're not above this point. The ambient's not above this point. We run just like every system we're working on today. So this is actually, this condenser is down here, and now it's condensing. So if you don't get above that 87.8 or 31 degrees Celsius, you just run as the systems you're working on today. Pressures are still a little bit higher. You know, you could be running at 900 PSI on your discharge. But it's only pressures. If you troubleshoot in temperatures, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think of it. One of the, we'll talk about a few of the safety things when you're dealing with higher pressures like that. Great question. Okay, this is a document from my good friends from Copeland. And it really kind of gives me an idea. So all that, that spaghetti mess that I drew on there, we're going to walk through it here. So a cylinder, and I know it's hard to see, a cylinder right here, and they, they probably have cylinders here, at 68 degrees or 20 degrees Celsius is 816 PSI in it or 56 bar. So in that cylinder. So it's a higher pressure in the cylinder at room, close to room temperature. Okay? So you want to be aware of that. So if you're working on CO2 for the first time, do it safely, put earplugs in, safety glasses on, gloves on, turn the thing away from you in a safe area, and then open it up and listen to what that sounds. That's CO2 if a pressure relief leaks, one of them leaks. So you can hear it loud. Okay, now, one thing about CO2, it's a natural refrigerant, but it's, and it's one GWP, global warming potential, so it's better for the planet in that sense, but you still don't wanna, uh, release it to the environment. Still bad. One GWP is still bad. Okay, so we got to keep it in the system. Next, is this is the pressure range. You could go from all the way from 700 PSI to 1500 PSI on the high side. Okay, so there's a big range. Depending on where you're at, what the ambient is out. So you got to consider that. Okay, well my, my range is uh, there. Then we have Next, from there, we got our flash tank pressure, our liquid pressure. So you guys call this your liquid pressure. So it's the same here. This is the liquid pressure, but it has a range. So it go from four, uh, 470 all the way down to uh, 620 PSI. And then we have another pressure in the system. So our medium temp suction. So this one here, for an example, is a four, 407 PSI 
or 28 bar. And then lastly would be the low temp suction, minus 4 or 271 PSI. So the thing is, is that you got to think about this just a little bit different. It is higher pressures, but it works just as the same refrigeration system. You need compression, push it up above the, the ambient, so we can either condense or cool that, that refrigerant. Then we have our metering devices that we reduce that pressure down. Then we have our liquid going to our metering devices that drop the pressure even more. It's like a two-step of dropping the pressure. And then we have our evaporators, sucking the heat out of everything. It's very key to understand that it's not much different. It's higher pressures. Some of the safety things. When you're dealing with systems like CO2 over in the thousands of pounds, you've got to use different gauges. You can't just use your 410 gauges, even though they're higher pressure, you want to use transcritical gauges. So anytime you're on the high side, you need to use uh, higher pressure gauges. As you can see, this goes up to 3,000 PSI and 210 bar. The hoses are rated, higher rated, where your 410 hoses are rated for 800 PSI. Could you use that on the low temp? You could. You could use it on the low temp system because you're running around 200 PSI. So that those 410 gauges or CO2 subcritical gauges will be able to handle it. But if you're ever, ever working on the high side, you need to have transcritical gauges. One good thing about CO2, there's so many pressure and temperature probes that you don't have to worry about that because you can use the controller and look at everything. That's what I love about it. Another key thing that you want to understand is the CO2. There, remember I said earlier, you've got to add vapor. So you want to understand, right now when you go to a tank, a lot of times you'll have a, you may have two different ports. You can have a vapor and a liquid port. All that means is there's a dip tube that goes down in it. These ones are separate. So you have a siphon, which has a port in there that will give you liquid, and then you have other ones that don't have that siphon tube that go all the way down, so that'll be a vapor cylinder. So you charge vapor first, you get it to 100 PSI, 150 PSI, or 10 bar of vapor, and then you charge your liquid in the system. Then you don't create what, if you do it that way? Dry ice, great job. Okay, we've got a little video here to walk around the system here. Okay, so this is actual uh, a CO2, let me pause it here, stop. Okay, what do we see right there? What do we see right here? Scroll compressor, who here works on a scroll compressor? Show me some hands. Every hand goes up, and online you guys are putting your hands up too. Is that different than what you're working on today? No, right? Okay, so we got two fix. This is the low temp side of this rack, and then we got a digital compressor on there. So digital compressor is a form of capacity control. Next step, when we get to this point. This here's oil management system. So all of you that work on supermarket racks, you will see some type of oil management system. This makes sure the oil stays at the compressors. So any of you that work in commercial HVAC and you have long runs, three or 400 feet, you'll have some sort of either oil management at the compressor itself or maybe even a system like this. In your residential uh, systems, that oil is just being pushed through with the compressor. Maybe we'll walk through a little bit and I'll just... So once again, here's the low temp compressors. We have an oil management system to make sure that oil stays at the system. You are going to have to learn about all those components as you go through. Then you have a, a vessel there that's an uh, oil receiver. Here is a bunch of Belimos. How many of you work on zoning systems? Show of hands. So almost all of you. That's zoning. So think about the zoning that you do in an air conditioning or an HVAC thing. That's zoning for on a refrigeration system or removing the heat to different parts. Then we have a receiver right here. This is the receiver that stores all that liquid refrigerant. And then as we go through, these are the medium temp compressors. So if you work in refrigeration, there are semi-hermetic compressors. And then at the end is the air conditioning circuits. Then here's some more electronic valves on the system your, through your suction. This is the thing that you want to relate all this stuff that you learn all these new technologies. And it doesn't matter if it's VRF, it's a heat pump. These are those high pressure valves I talked about. Those are the high pressure valves taking that 1500, 1400 PSI, dropping it down into that liquid pressure that we're looking for, good quality liquid pressure. The big thing is, is that you want to invest your, yourself into learning about it. 
If you're going to work on CO2, if you want to get a, on a, with a company on CO2, you got to take CO2 training. And we offer tons of uh, CO2 training, supermarket trainings at Refrigeration Mentor, but you got to invest the time in yourself. I'll tell you to start right now, all of you online, what you can do is head to the Refrigeration Mentor YouTube channel. I got over 80 videos with some of the best professionals and the top experts around the world talking about CO2 refrigeration. And anything that you go forward and working on, so you can take your uh, phone out and you can scan this. There's a little quiz here. So just put it on camera. You can, you can scan it and anybody online, they'll have to write this, this in right here. Put that, that in. And there's a little quiz on some of the things that we talked about today if you want to challenge yourself. But this is what refrigeration is. It's challenging yourself each day. Not doing the same thing over and over again and then all of a sudden six, seven years go by and you're, okay, I haven't done anything different. You got to learn something new, at least for me, it's I'm trying to learn something new every day. And it's really, and it's not always easy to do that. You got to invest in yourself. You're here. This is your one, one big investment starting off the year, which is great. But you always got to continue to invest in yourself. Take training courses, professional training course, refrigeration training courses. Uh, lastly, to find out more about refrigeration mentor programs, you can, you can scan that. Welcome for questions. I know this is a journey. Think about what you do right now as your journey and start planning on where you want to be. CO2 is going to be a part of your life. Natural refrigerants are going to be a part of your life. Not sure what area it will be and, what ta and when it's going to happen, but it's going to be a part of your life. So just embrace it. Refrigeration, embrace it. A lot of people make it harder than what it is. If you use some of those terminologies that I talked about, you share this knowledge. The biggest thing what you need to do is share this knowledge. One thing from today, whatever is one thing you learn, uh, go talk about it with somebody else. That's how you're going to grow your knowledge. That's why I'm so good at what I do, is because I try to share my knowledge. Then I learn something new, I share it with them. Then I ask them, what do you think about that? What do you think? And then we, we compare. And then I go back, man, was I, did I, is that exactly right or not? So let's go back, let's ask the other professionals until I come up with my own results. And that's the same as uh, how you troubleshoot systems. You always want to find the facts. And then you make your, determine your decision off that. It's like sharing knowledge. Find the facts, share the knowledge, find the facts, come up with some ideas on it. Questions? Love it. Thank you so much for taking the time. But do you have any questions? We've got a few minutes left here. Are there any like, major more than just the The question was, is anybody doing anything residentially for CO2? So that's a great question. What's your name again? Kevin. So Kevin asks, is there anything going on with CO2 for residential? So back in 2000, in Japan, they installed millions of CO2 water heaters residentially. So they're out there. There's lots across uh, North America. Yeah, they're not as big and as popular as people say, but they will be. Um, there's a couple of manufacturers here that build uh, water heaters and uh, CO2 heat pumps. But the thing is, is that it's uh, advanced uh, more advanced technology at this point. But when we move three or four or five years down the road, it's not going to seem as advanced because it's going to be the norm. Yeah, great question. Oh, great. Yeah, great question. What are the specific issues that come up with CO2? What issues do you have with your residential systems? Same thing. <laughs> same thing. So anything that you can think of, it's going to be the same. It's refrigeration. So if you have a VRF or VRV system, we've got a lot of controls on it, got electronic valves, we got boards. All those things can run into problems or issues. Same on a CO2 system. So it's, we're, a lot of people are making it a lot harder than what it is. Yes, you have, you have a lot of uh, controls on it. You've got electronics. If you don't know that stuff, it's going to be a lot, a lot difficult. And the biggest thing is, is installs. One good thing about CO2 in the commercial aspect, people are a little wary about it. They're not complacent like they are with HFC because over 30, 40, 50 years of working with this refrigerant, there's a lot of complacency. Where now with CO2, it's higher pressure, there's fear in it. People are taking their time to, to make those jobs right. And I've been noticing over the last 10 years, jobs that were taking a couple months, now we're getting back to the way supermarket goes, now it's less and less and less time. People get more confident and comfortable working with it. But the same issues, the same issues arise. So this is a, something that I hear 
It depends who you ask. <laughs> depends who you ask. Is it, a, is it because it's higher pressure, should it leak more? Well, think about your pressure washer at home. This is a great analogy. So a lot of people are like, oh my God, the pressure is so high, it's 1,500 PSI. Who has a pressure washer at their house right now? Put a hands up. Everybody. What pressure is that at? 1,800, 3,000 PSI, 200 bar. That's way higher pressure, and that's open. This is supposed to be an assistant. That's open pressure. You go across your foot, you're probably going to hurt yourself. Right? So it's way lower. So you've got to put it in perspective on, on, on that. So leaks. Some people are going to say, oh, they leak more. But how are they measuring? It's the question. Because a lot of people are just letting all the gas out because, oh, it's natural. We can just blow it off and then repair, repair instead of just moving it to a different system or moving around or isolating it in certain places. Great question. Okay, so the question is, advantage of a CO2 over a synthetic. So one, one big thing is the heat index. So now I can get, I can almost boil water with CO2, where you cannot do that with uh, synthetic or HFC. So you can do, uh, I'm seeing a lot of systems that do a lot of heat reclaim and heat recovery. So we're using the systems more now than we did before. I've been in supermarket for a long time, and we did heat recovery, and we did heat reclaim, always. Um, but with CO2, now that's a big advantage there. Right now, uh, I've, I've seen so many energy comparisons. I've seen where HFC is way more, or synthetics way more efficient. Then I've seen CO2 where it's way more efficient. It all depends on who's working the numbers. But what I'll tell you right now, CO2 can be more energy, uh, could use more energy, potentially, depending on who designed it. But uh, since the last 10 years I've been involved, that that energy efficiency dropped dramatically. And we're like at a very close comparison right now. Another 10 years is going to be more efficient, most likely. Because we spent 40 years or 30 years on synthetics. We're only in it a few years. You know what I mean? CO2 is still new. It's not new. It's been out for 150, 200 years in refrigeration, 150. But, it, but you know, as more people invest in it and they did do their designs, because everyone's like, oh, we're in Florida. It's hot here all the time. It's not efficient. Well, if you design it with parallel compression, ejectors, and all these technologies that I'm not going to talk about today, you can make it very, very efficient. CO2, you get smaller pipes. You get smaller compressors. You get more capacity out of a uh, CO2 compressor than, at the same time, than an HFC compressor. So these are just the things that you need to learn about over time. But the energy efficiency, I've seen so many different models. Are you got heat reclaim? Are you using air conditioning with it? There's a medium, low temp. What's the design? So. It's hard to say. I do apples to apples comparisons. But at some point, I believe it'll be more efficient. And it's regulation that's pushing it as well. So, Any more questions? So the temperature that you can get out of a refrigerant. So, so you got a, a boiling point. But as you compress that refrigerant, you got a heat point. So you, can, you, you only can go so high with it. And so there's different, depending on the different refrigerants, you can get different amount of heat out of it. And so with CO2, you can get a lot of heat out of it compared to, say, 404 or 410. And so now it's very viable for heat pump applications. Yeah. yeah. And another thing that people don't look at for CO2, it'll pull down a system way faster. So if you're using an A2L or... An, uh, even A3, which is very good, or um, an HFC, uh, ice rinks. I'm working with a lot of people doing ice rinks. The, they're pulling down the ice in half the time compared to what they used to do with CO2, just because that's how efficient the heat index. I can pull stuff, the heat out faster. And you're using smaller pipes. So depending on the comparison, but that, that's really what it is. You can get a lot of heat out of CO2. So I hope this was beneficial for you. Head to the Refrigeration Mentor website. Head to some of the training programs. Check it. There's a ton of free stuff on the podcast, the YouTube channel. S in, uh, check me out on Instagram or LinkedIn, whatever your favorite social media platforms. Connect with me. Let's have a conversation outside after this. And, and, and thank you. And welcome to the wonderful world of CO2. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you're willing, give this video a thumbs up and drop us a comment. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated with all of our future videos. And as a quick reminder, HVAC School isn't just a YouTube channel. Dive deeper with us at our main website, HVACRschool.com. Curious for more knowledge on the go? We've got you covered. Tune into the HVAC School podcast available on all your favorite podcast apps.
And while you're at it, join our thriving Facebook group. Also, don't miss out on our free mobile applications available for both iPhone and Android. We're all about community. Vortex by Tex.